story. I kind of feel like we're in our own tree house in the rain, our little unlikely story tree house up here, all cozy. Um, so thank you all for coming out on this blustery day. Um, we really appreciate your support. We couldn't be here and bring you all these amazing authors if it wasn't for you coming out. So thank you. <coughs> Today we have two amazing authors. The first one is all the way from Australia, down under. His name is Andy Griffiths. And he is one of Australia's most popular children's authors, kind of like our own Jeff Kinney over here. Um, Andy is best known for the Treehouse series, the Just Books, and as I told my husband today, I said, yeah, the author we have today, I said his first book is called The Day My Butt Went Psycho. <laughs> is that what you mean? Yeah. Um, and they do call it Bum in Australia. So, uh, over the last 20 years, Andy's books have been New York Times bestsellers, adapted for the stage and television, and won more than 50 Australian Children's Choice Awards. He beat Jeff. Sorry, Jeff. <laughs> Andy is a passionate advocate for literacy. He's an ambassador for the Indigenous Literacy Foundation and the Pyjama Foundation. Andy lives with his wife and two daughters in Melbourne, Australia, where he divides his time between story writing and butt fighting. <laughs> And he is here today on the actual release date to introduce the fifth book in the Treehouse series, the 65-story Treehouse. It used to be 52 stories, but they keep expanding it. It is a pet grooming salon, a birthday room where it's always your birthday, even when it's not, a room full of exploding eyeballs, a lollipop shop, a quicksand pit, an ant farm, and a time machine, which is going to be really, really useful now since Terry messed up again, and the treehouse just failed in a safety inspection. So Andy's going to tell you all about that, and Jeff will be here talking about his newest book, uh, which we are now have a movie diary out next month, so we're very excited about that, and you can also pre-order the book and have it signed um, beforehand by Jeff. So, to introduce Andy, I would like to introduce our very own Jeff Kinney, the owner of An Unlikely Story. Just here to introduce Andy. I'm up here to speak for like 25 minutes, so I, you're gonna have to get a little bit used to me up here. Um, so first of all, thank you so much for coming out today to an unlikely story. Thank you for supporting our independent bookstore. Um, we think independent bookstores are really a huge part of the community, uh, so we're very pleased that you've become part of our unlikely story. Um, so this is actually a really special day for me uh, to be able to share a stage with Andy. I've gotten to do it twice before, once in Australia, once in Chicago. So this is all really uh, very exciting for me. That's a little loud, I think, a little bit There we go. Now probably too low. Okay, we're good. Okay, so I wanted to tell you actually, before we get Andy out here to tell you his story, uh, I wanted to tell you a little bit about Diary of a Wimpy Kid and how I became an author. And it started for me actually with comics. I was a comics fan, and that was thanks to my father. My father uh, collected comics as a kid in the 1940s, 50s, and 60s, and his favorites became my favorites, which were Donald Duck and Uncle Scrooge and comics by this guy named Karl Barks. As I got a little bit older, I started to get into newspaper comics. So how many grown-ups remember Calvin and Hobbes? A good number. How many kids know Calvin and Hobbes? A good number, okay. So Calvin and Hobbes was one of my favorite cartoons, uh, my favorite newspaper cartoons. And I also loved The Far Side, I loved Bloom County, and many others. One of my favorite comics that came out when I was in high school, I think it was my graduating year, about 1989, was Big Nate. I'll bet the kids know Big Nate, is that true? A lot of kids know Big Nate. What I really liked about Big Nate was that a lot of times in comics, um, the cartoon characters who are kids actually act like grown-ups. So if you think of even Calvin and Charlie Brown and the Peanuts, they kind of act like miniature adults. And what I really liked about Big Nate was that the kids acted like kids. And I think that that had an influence on me later on when I became a cartoonist for real. So when I went off to college, I went to Villanova first and then eventually Maryland. I created my own comic strip. And it was this cartoon called Igdoof. And Igdoof, as you can see here, is this strange looking character. He's got big eyes, 
He's got big lips and a big nose and big ears. And he's got one thing in common with Greg Heffley, which you guys can probably see, right? He's got three strands of hair on his head. It turns out that there's a long history of boy cartoon characters who are bald or nearly bald, right? So we have Charlie Brown, we have uh, Henry, uh, we have Caillou eventually, right? <laughs> Ziggy, I guess he was a man, but he was bald. I think the reason that cartoonists do that is because they want you to know who the main character is. They want the main character to be so different from the other characters that you really can tell who it is. So that's what I decided with Igdu. So what happened was, I spent a few years living here in Massachusetts trying to become a syndicated newspaper cartoonist. But I couldn't break in. I kept sending out submission packets like this one. And I would just get rejection letters back. So for about three years, I would spend, say, eight or nine months putting together a submission packet sending it out there, getting rejection letters back, and not knowing really what to do because none of the rejection letters gave me any positive feedback. They all just said, you know, dear creator, or they might as well have just had the word no on them. You know, they, they didn't give me anything that I could change or improve upon. So eventually I had this idea, which was the idea for Diary of a Wounded Kid. I said, what if I took away newspapers and I started doing uh, comics in, in a book instead. So I had the idea for Diary of a Wounded Kid in 1998, right? So how many kids were born after 1998? <laughs> a lot, almost all, right? Almost all. So I came up with the idea for Diary of a Wounded Kid in 1998. And I started writing down in the sketchbook every funny thing that had happened to me as a kid. So my idea was I would literally write down every funny thing that happened to me and my kid in my childhood, and I started writing everything down in this sketchbook. I know it's a little fuzzy here on this big screen, but you can see on the side monitors as well. These are some of the ideas that made their way from my real life into Diary of a Wimpy Kid eventually. And I started really packing the pages with these ideas, and by the very last page, it looked like this, right? It was just packed with ideas. This one page took me four months to fill out, and it took me four years to fill out my whole sketchbook with ideas for Diary of a Kid. Uh, so four years. The kinds of things that made their way from my real life into Diary of a Kid were things like this. Now, how many kids can you tell me what book this is from? You can't guess. You have to know. Yes? It's from Roger Rules. It's from Roger Rules. He knows it right off, right? Have you been here before? Yes. Yes, okay. Shooter. Okay. <laughs> no, that's okay. Um, so here's a scene from Roger Rules, right, where the teenagers accidentally take a picture of their own party, right? And so where that came from, and now you, you know this already, was a real life thing that happened to me. Here's, here's what it looked like when I made it into the book. Here's this picture where the teenagers accidentally take a picture of their own party. Uh, where that came from was that when I was in high school, I had a girlfriend, and her mother uh, had a camera on the shelf, and she reached for it to grab it, and when she did, she pressed the button and took a picture of herself, right? So it was the world's first selfie, I think, right? And you can see the expression is really the same <laughs> as what's in the book. So a lot of the ideas for Diary of Movie Kids started off as something that happened in real life, and then it got twisted and twisted again, and then it ended up in, in the book. So. One of the things I would say to all the kids in the audience is that writing a Diary of a Wimpy Kid style book isn't hard at all. You have so much material to, to start with because if you just start writing down the funny things that happen in your life, you could easily write 10 Diary of a Wimpy Kid style books. So I'd really encourage you to start journaling. Some of the other things that happened in real life were, for example, this story where my brother, uh, on the first day of summer vacation, he woke me up in the middle of the night he told me I had slept through all of summer, right? I missed the trip to Disney World, but that luckily I had woken up just in time for the first day of school, right? So that happened in real life. Another thing that happened in real life was that my friend and I had this really bad idea of a game where he would go by and I'd try to hit him with a ball. And then I did, or I actually got the ball under the tire and he flipped over and broke his wrist, so don't do that. 
Um, but along the way, as I was drawing these pictures for Diary of a Wimpy Kid, I started to really learn about cartooning and the art of cartooning. So my style for Igdoof was more sophisticated than Diary of a Wimpy Kid. But when I drew these drawings, I was really trying to draw like a kid. So I simplified and simplified my style to, until I couldn't simplify it any further. And what I learned is that a good cartoonist really tries to use as little information as possible to make the biggest impact. So I always challenge myself to use as few lines as possible when I'm drawing my pictures. So, 1998, I came up with the idea for Diary of Wimpy Kid. I worked on my sketchbook for four years. Then I worked for another four years on my first draft, so eight years total. And then eventually, I brought it out to New York Comic Con, walked around with this little sample pack, and I found an editor who was willing to publish my work. So eight years, and then another year before the book got published. And actually, just this past week was the 10th anniversary of the first Diary of Wimpy Kid coming out. So that was really cool. Thank you. So here was the first book, which I got, you know, just off the street here in Plainville. I got the first book, and I, it was so exciting to get a book in the mail, because that's what, becoming an author, that's what it's all about. It's the idea that you have an idea that's in your head, and then somebody else puts it down on paper, you know, and it, it makes it into something real. So I think that's really exciting. So I wanted to talk a little bit about cartooning, actually. Let's see if I can get this technology working. I talked about cartooning being the art of simplification. So I'm going to show you. Oh, looks like I need to calibrate this. This is embarrassing. So hold on. I'm going to answer a few emails too while I'm up here. <laughs> so let's see. OK, there, 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 and there. OK, now I can draw. So I actually do all of my cartoons these days on this tablet. Okay, so you can see I can draw right onto the screen, which is really nice and handy. I think, where's Kim? Kim, are you around? This thing's beeping, it's beeping like a bomb. Is it not there? <laughs> <laughs> Never say that kind of thing in a crowded room. Okay, so. Okay, it stopped. I don't know if that's good or bad. Okay, it's, it's just gonna make me nervous, that's all. Okay. So to give you an idea, I think the best cartoonists, they can get across the point of their creations with incredible efficiency. So I'm going to draw just a line or two, and you tell me what cartoon character it is, okay? It's not mine. Okay. No guessing if you've been here already. Okay, yes? Charlie Brown. Charlie Brown, that's right. Very good. First guess. And I didn't even draw it that well, but you knew. Right, so look at Charlie Brown's hair. And so Charles Schultz really created this creation that you really know who it is with just that little squiggle, okay? This one, I'm guessing nobody except for this guy in the front row can guess it, right, without me drawing more than, with just one line, right? Does anybody know who this cartoon character is from just one line? She says Greg, no. Yes? Big Nate, no, I'm going to give you, how about this line, and then this line. Yes? Close, yes? Not Rally, yes? It's a character you know well. Yep. SpongeBob, very good. Yes. Right? I know, I didn't draw it well. And some, some kid's like, it looks, yours looks bad. <laughs> um, all right, how about a superhero? You ready? No guessing. You have to know. You have to know. Yes. Not Superman. Yes. Way back there in the pinkish shirt. Can you yell? Oh, yeah, it's Superman. He just dropped out. Okay, yes, in the middle of the room. No, no, you guys are going to just guess. So here we go. I'm going to give you another line here. I heard it. I heard somebody say it. Spider Man. That's right. Right? The eyes. Right? Okay, I'm going to have that. I'll give you just one line. I'll bet you can get this from one line. OK, 
Okay, yes. Not Snoopy, but you're not so far off. How about on the couch? Yes. He's not sure. I know, you're going to guess again. Woodstock, very good, yes. So the point I'm trying to get across here is the fact that, you know, a good, a good cartoonist really can communicate their drawing in just a few lines, or just one in this case. So let's see, here we go. How about, I'm going to go with another line. This one's a little self-indulgent, so I know the kids won't know what that means, but all right, go for it. Great, great. So I'm going to draw two more lines, and you can see that I've got Greg's hair. So hopefully if I've done my job, kids 10 years from now will know that that's Greg Hefley, right? Or kids right now. So I'm going to actually draw a few Gregs. Let's see. And I am going to draw it so poorly that you're going to wonder if I'm actually the guy who does these drawings. Because it's hard to draw under pressure. Usually I draw on a really big screen and I zoom way, way, way in. But right now I'm drawing on a, a smaller screen here. Okay, so most drawings of Greg start off like this, right? That's right, I'm copying and pasting. This is how I make my living, guys. Okay. All right, so Greg usually starts off like this. This is how Greg looks in almost all of his drawings. And I just want to show you how just a few lines can really change the way that you think of the character. So there's a line there, right? There's a line here. Let's go with here. I'll go with the mouth open here. Right? And another mouth open here. So you can see these characters now look completely different from one another. And we can do this here. And we can do this here. So four really different looks. Okay, now, watch out if I just add a little line or two. So right here, how does Greg feel where you see the mouse hovering? Sad. Sad, look in here. Happy. Here, what does he look like he's doing? I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to give you another hint. Here we go. Talking. Right, talking. And how about here? How does he look here? Scared. Scared? And we'll get back to that one. So watch how if I just add the smallest line, I can make you feel totally differently about him here. Now how does he feel? Tired. Tired. That's right. Just that one line, a bag under your eye, tells you that the character's tired. So here's happy. How about a totally different expression here? So we can do this. For example, right? he's trying. I hear hungry. I would say he's hungry. That's how I'd show Greg looking hungry. It, we said, we agreed, I think, that he's talking here. Now, if I just add this line right here, say he's shouting, right? Now, this one right here, he looks scared, but I think it's not exactly enough. So, a little nervous, right? If you were really scared, your pupils are going to dilate. Right? So, I'm going to make his eyes really big. Right? And if I really want you to believe he's scared, I'm going to add that. Maybe I'll add some sort of tremor lines here. Trembling lines, I'm not sure what they'd be called. Shaking lines, right. So here is Greg. In four different states. So you can see that I just changed a few lines in each one. Okay, I'm going to show you how much a character can change. Let's take a look here. I'm going to erase this hair here. And I'm going to do this in about, let's say, six lines. Okay? So we've got Greg, like he always starts off. But now if I go like this. Right? right? So those lines, what, what you're finding out about the cartoon characters, obviously they're not that 
different from one another, which shows I don't have much skill or imagination. Right? But it also tells you that Greg is brothers with Roger, because what do we see? We see they have a lot of physical features in common. They have the same head shape, they have the same eyes, the same nose, the same mouth shape, right? The same ears. And of course, Greg has another brother, so let's go take a look at him. All right, so here is Manny. You can see that he doesn't, we're starting off, and he really doesn't look much like Greg Hefley. Right? Until you get around to this, right? Right here is where he starts to look like Greg. We have an ear, okay? And, and then we have one, two, three hairs, right? So we know that that's Greg Hefley's brother, Manny. Now, I know you've seen me do this before, but I'm going to try and I'm going to do it right this time, okay? Because last time it didn't go so well. So my idea is, I think that I've been drawing these characters for 10 years, and this is my chance to prove that I can draw the characters with my eyes closed. Okay, so are you ready? Oh, I really can't put on my glasses if I'm saying that my eyes are closed, can I? I think I actually have a, sadly, weirdly, I have a blindfold. Let's see. All right, I have a blindfold. Okay, here we go. So this is going to be Manny. I'm going to take one last peek to get my pen on the right spot. You ready? No peeking, I promise. So far, yes? Yes. And? Yes or no? Yes. Really? A little bit, a little bit. A little off? Yes. All right. Yes. Am I getting further off track here? Yes. I promise this was going to be the time. All right, we have. translated into 53 languages, including, including Latin. So here's a picture of the Latin version. And I was just in Italy yesterday. Um, just yesterday, truly, yesterday. Um, so the first copy of the Latin version actually got handed to the Pope, right? So that really happened. That is not me, this guy that looks vaguely like me. That's the guy who translated it, the uh, priest who translated it. But I wanted to tell you a funny story um, of something that happened here in the States. So a few years ago, I was invited to be a part of the White House Easter egg roll when President Obama was in office. So I, my family and I got invited to the White House. And so here's a picture of my dad, my mom, and President Obama and his family, and then my family over here to the right. So I have a wife named Julie, and a son named Will, who's the tall guy, and then Grant, who's the littler guy. And um, Will just last week outgrew me at age 14, so it's a little scary. Uh, but this is how he looked on that day a few years ago. So what happened was my kids really wanted to be a part of uh, the White House experience. They wanted to read with me on the White House lawn, or they wanted to sit next to me. And I was like, oh boy, any, any parent can, you know, any parent knows this, is that your kids are not going to behave when you need them to behave. And my kids, you know, are sometimes kind of bad. Um, so I was really nervous. I was already nervous about the experience, but then this idea of having them on stage with me is really nerve-wracking. 
Um, but they, they did. They came and sat next to me. And here's a picture of, of Will and Grant. They squirmed in their chairs a little bit. But we had this one really kind of authentic, magical moment when Grant was just learning to read. And he'd never read my books. Um, so at one point, I had the book in my lap. And then Grant came over, and he read the book out of my lap. It, it was really cool. And so the next day, I was kind of on cloud nine. We came back to Plainville, and I went on the White House website and found out that, uh, that they posted the video of me reading. And of course, narcissist that I am, I watched the whole video. And I found out that at the moment that Grant was reading out of my lap, my older son, Will, was spanking him. <laughs> ideas for a diary but we could get books to come. But, oh yeah, this is, a, this is a double feature today. So like I said, I'm, I'm very excited to introduce our next speaker, our next presenter. Uh, his name is Andy Griffiths. If you haven't read any of his Treehouse books, they're brilliant. Uh, he's way funnier than I am, uh, but he's, he can't draw at all. So that's where I have him. Uh, he does not bring his own blindfolds, but I'm sure he's going to entertain you. Uh, so, all the way from Australia, let's bring to the stage Andy Griffiths. for all coming out here and this is very special for me because I'm a Wimpy Kid fan too and uh, I once wanted to write Jeff a, a fan letter um, but I thought he probably gets hundreds and millions of letters so I didn't do it and um, I was very excited one day when he, he reached out and said he'd like to do a show in Australia um, with me there and um, actually on stage so this was kind of freaky um, but uh, so this is really nice, and obviously you've noticed I have an Australian accent. Yeah. Uh, has anyone understood anything I've said so far? Uh, one, two, three, four. Okay, I'll work on the rest, I'll speak slower. Um, let me just check, I also work with Australian humour, and I just need to check that you understand that. Here is a classic Australian joke. Why did the koala fall out of the tree? Yes? I think I know it from one of the books. You know it from one of the books. What's the answer? If it's from the book, then I know it. If it's yeah. not, then I don't know it. Yes, yeah, I think it is. Because it was dead. <laughs> you did know it. That's good. Um, okay, for bonus points, but not you. And not the other one down here. Uh, uh, why did the second koala fall out of the tree? Yes. Because it was hit by the first koala. <laughs> I see this has gone before me. Uh, what am I going to say next? Uh, yep. Why did the third koala fall out of the tree? And? Um, because I was a game. Thought it was a game and jumped in. <laughs> Shows how dumb koalas are. Uh, now, there was a book, uh, the one that didn't get in the book, because it's so bad it couldn't be published in America but I'm allowed to say it, I hope. Um, this is my favourite joke from when we were in primary school. Why did the boy fall off his bike? Joseph. Because he was dead. Because he was dead. <laughs> it's arguably funnier than the actual answer. Um, but it's not the correct answer, so no. Um, dead people can't ride bikes. <laughs> Don't be silly. Uh, yes. Because he was paralysed? <laughs> paralysed people can't ride bikes. Right? <laughs> now, who's got a sensible answer? Uh, yes. Because he hit a rock. Um, well, he did hit a rock, but it's not where he fell off. The, the actual answer is because his mother threw a refrigerator at him. <laughs> Uh, whose who's mother has thrown a refrigerator at them? Be honest. Uh, no, no, no. Honest, 
common in Australia. How many mothers or fathers have wanted to throw a refrigerator out there? Thank you for your honesty. Um, now I use, um, you saw Jeff using real life in from his drawing, from his real life in his drawings. I used this real joke to write my first ever proper joke. And this joke is, you'll see where it's modelled from. Why did the boy fail his maths test? Yes? Because he didn't study. He didn't study, but it's not why he failed this particular test. Um, yes? Because he was dead. Because he was dead. <laughs> no, not every joke is funny because the person is dead. Yes. You forgot. Uh, yes. Because he was Terry. Um, now, for those of you who don't know my, illust my illustrator, Terry Denton, he is really dumb. Um, so, no, it wasn't Terry. No, the answer is actually much more simple than you think. It's because his mother threw another refrigerator. <laughs> You were going to say that. Yeah. All right. Um, all right. One, one last easy one. Uh, why did the Why did the boy suffer multiple injuries, crushed vertebrae, ruptured organs, um, flat hands, flat legs, flat head, uh, and a very sore thumb? Uh, yeah. No, he was hit by a truck. <laughs> Well, that was obvious. <laughs> they had truck injuries. You don't feel too bad because the truck was driven by his mother. That's my computer screen. Uh, I have an office. So screeching balloon level. Uh, that's a really good way to annoy your parents. If you get a balloon, blow it up and just screech it out. Um, I'll give you a demonstration later. Okay, now I'm going to show you, uh, I can't draw as Jeff so kindly pointed out, um, but I can, I, I do have Terry there and I can boss him around and get him to draw stuff. Um, and one day I said, can you draw a treehouse with a bowling alley? and a tank full of man-eating sharks, right? The dangerous, most dangerous treehouse in the world. And meanwhile, I'll go and research trees, uh, which involves us looking at pictures of trees on the internet, pretending that I'm working. Now, I'm going to show you some trees, and I want you to tell me if they're a good tree for building a multi-level treehouse, or a bad tree, all right? First tree. Yeah. Um, that's who thinks that's a good tree? Who thinks it's not a good tree for a big tree house? Many more people. Why, what's wrong with this tree house? Why would you not build a tree in this one? Because why? Not enough branches. Good, yes. Long way up to walk and then if you have a fight with Terry and he pushes you out, it's a very long way to fall and then it's a long way back so you can push him out. Because that's fair, isn't it? If someone pushes you out of a tree, you should climb up and push them out. Fair. Too tall. What about this one? You, how many like this one? Not too many. Who does not feel like this tree? Who would not build a tree house in this one? Because it looks like a silo. A silo. Um, maybe, I think the problem is with the branches again, they're just too crazy. Um, and it's not, it's not somewhere we could build a proper tree house. So let's have a look at another tree. <laughs> Sorry, you would build in that tree? How many would build in this tree? No, you're making a 
big mistake. Never build a tree house in a butt tree. So do I. Look at the big branches, plenty of room for expansion, um, vines to swing on so that, and vines to hide in. So now we've got our tree, we know roughly what we want. We just have to decide on the style of a tree house. We can have simple. Who likes this one? No. Too, too what? Too high, yes. Uh, what about this one? Too leafy. You are the fussiest person I've ever met. Yeah, I like the castle, I like the many bedrooms, I like the moats full of alligators, but too leafy. Um, what else have you got? Uh, maybe this one. <coughs> An ultra modest. How many people think this looks like a giant eyeball? Yeah, okay, so not just me. And, keep your hand up, how many people like spying on other people? <laughs> Very common task, no? Good. Um, you can sit in your giant eyeball, secret eyeball, and you can spy on everyone in the forest. And no one would know you're there. Except for that lady. <laughs> Obviously, onto your secret tree house. So she's your enemy, and you must destroy her. <laughs> And her meddling dog. Uh, that white thing down there. I recommend opening the front of the treehouse and throwing a fridge at them. Uh, that's the little one for the dog. Uh, what about this one? This looks like, this looks like it could fly. Alright, so now I get ideas. A tree house that could, could go out into space, or, or at least just fly around the world. So you see, how, you see how stories just come out of looking at pictures. And that's what Terry does for me, because while I was wasting time um, pretending to research on the internet, he was actually working. And this was his first version of the tree house that I'd asked for. And if you count those, you will get roughly 13 levels as long as you don't count that really little one at the top. Uh, but 13 is a cool number, and I just thought, that's great. And um, I waited a little while, and Terry added the detail, um, put the, the sharks in. It's easier to see once he's tidied it all up. Yeah. You see, he got, we got the bowling alley, uh, a tank full of sharks, up the top, a giant catapult. Um, that's really good for putting people that you don't want in the treehouse in anymore. At fridges, um, <laughs> flinging them out uh, away from the treehouse. Now, it looks like it would be a really fun place, but you always need something to go wrong in a story. And in our story, but you know the three little pigs. What was their problem? Who built their houses? Yes, the big bad wolf. We have the exact same thing, except it's a big bad publisher. <laughs> with a very big nose and he's yelling at us you've got to get the book done but we're so distracted we can't get the book done well Terry is distracted um, and so he yells and if he gets really mad his nose gets bigger and bigger and bigger and finally explodes <laughs> and we'd quite like to avoid having his nose explode all over our treehouse so we try to get the book done then I said to Terry, can you do a 26-storey treehouse in double the amount of floors? And he said, sure, no problem. And so this is his 26-storey version, where we got a few things we forgot to get in the first one, including an anti-gravity chamber, that big egg up the top. You can just float around in there all day long. And on Tuesday nights, we have a um, special night, it's called Nude Night, where you can float around without your clothes on. <laughs> totally optional. Um, penguins uh, start coming into the treehouse on the ice skating pond. And there's also a very dangerous level, which is just here. Does anyone know what that really super dangerous level is? Yes. The Maze of Doom. The Maze of Doom. 
it's a maze so complicated that nobody who's ever gone in has ever come out again. And let me just show you the entrance. It says, enter at own risk, and down here, certain death ahead. Now, knowing that, knowing that you will never come out of the maze ever again, how many people here would choose to go into the maze? <laughs> You would because there's lots of penguins in there. Yeah, yeah. Oh, you like penguins. Welcome to the rest of your life. You know why those penguins are in here? Because they can't read the warning signs. And because they're penguins. No, they're in there because they couldn't read. You can read. Yeah. They don't have an excuse. But you do. But there's no rules. You can go in there. Um, and you can spend the rest of your life wandering around the maze of doom. Meanwhile, everyone who didn't just go in the maze of doom can come and visit the 39-storey treehouse. That was getting um, bigger at this point. A reader sent in a picture of an elephant with boxing gloves on its hands. I uh, thought it was so funny we made the trunkinator level. An elephant with a boxing glove on the end of its trunk where you can try to um, test your skill. And we got a volcano, which is the good for toasting marshmallows. I think you agree that's a necessary addition. Uh, there is a very scary roller coaster. This roller coaster is so scary that even dead people are too scared to go on it. It's not possible. It is possible. What's, what's not possible about it? I surveyed many dead people and they said no. We're already dead, but we're too scared of that roller coaster. Your point came out earlier. Dead people can't ride bikes here, they can't walk because their legs are broken. Dead people can't ride bikes, dead people can't. Um, can't what? They can't walk because their legs are broken. They can't walk. Yeah, but they can talk. <laughs> We've all heard ghosts in cemeteries at midnight. They go, ooh. I'm so scared of the roller coaster of doom. <laughs> I'm sure, I've heard it. There you go. If you would like to go on that roller coaster, that's your. Um, how many? How many went on this roller coaster, by the way? One, two, three. Okay, about half of you are left. Um, this is the 52-story treehouse. Now we had many dangerous <coughs> levels in here, but the most dangerous thing we faced was an opponent so horrible that if I was to show you this picture, many of you would, would have nightmares tonight. How many of you want to see it? One, two, three, four, five, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, three hundred. Uh, how many don't want to see it? One. I'm so responsible I can't show you the picture. Uh, because one, one girl, Kelly, might have nightmares. <laughs> Unless, Kelly, you agree to close your eyes so you don't see this horrible thing. Yep. And the mother has her uh, hands over her eyes. The rest of you be prepared. This is awful, but I've got to show you. <laughs> oh, Kelly, sorry, so sorry. Some parents are even so so awful they put these on their children's plates. <laughs> Uh, we had to fight vegetables um, in the 52-storey trees. Unfortunately, the best way to fight them is to eat them. Uh, so if you see a vegetable, best thing is eat it as fast as you can. And the sooner we eat all the vegetables, the sooner we, we will have a vegetable-free birth. <laughs> now, are you going to argue with me again, Tracy? <laughs> I like carrots. What about burning the Burning the vegetables in the volcano. <laughs> that sounds a bit dangerous. <laughs> 65-storey treehouse is uh, looking like that. And I can't remember what the dangerous level was there. Let me see. What about the oh, oh, actually... It's got, I'm going to show you the dangers, but first, this is our new book, and we have some great levels. If you like um, giving your pets fancy hairstyles, <laughs> Jill has a pet grooming um, salon in there. Look at those, look at that dog with a lovely hairstyle. 
Um, the horse is looking very fancy. Um, so you can come and groom pets. Uh, we have a birthday room where it's always your birthday every day of the year. Uh, you don't have to wait 364 days and you can enter every time. You'll get cake, you'll get someone singing happy birthday and you'll get presents as many times as you want. Um, for the adults, we have an unbirthday room where you can lose a year, lose a birthday every year you go in. But don't stay as long as Terry did. Because uh, he turned into a little baby and I had to change his diaper. Uh, wasted a lot of time. Looks mean to me there saying, Terry, you idiot, but to a baby. But it is Terry, so it's fair. Um, this is Terry in our cloning machine. You can make multiple copies of yourself. And uh, that's Terry making 200 copies of himself. So I got to say, Terry, you idiots. Uh, we have some wise owls who are always saying very, very wise things. Often so wise you can't really understand the wisdom involved. Ah, uh, Cheese sticks. Poop, poop. Uh, they are so wise. Um, this is the invisible level. That was a good day's drawing for Terry. Talk about simplification, Jeff. Um, this is a level, I don't understand it, but everyone seems to like it, a room full of exploding eyeballs. So you go in this room and your eyeballs will explode. How many people would go in this room? Yeah, I don't understand it, but it's very popular. Um, now, we did have a big problem in this book with a, a safety inspector who came to inspect the treehouse and see if we had a planning permit for a treehouse. He got very upset because there was no um, fence around the shark tank. There was no, uh, no wheelchair uh, disabled access ramp. Um, there was no fire extinguishers, no nothing. So we, we got in a lot of trouble and he ordered the demolition of the treehouse. And I said to Terry, let's go back in time and get the tree, the permit that we were supposed to get. And he said, perfect, because I've made a wheelchair, a, wheelchair a, a time machine out of a garbage can, out of a garbage wheelie bin. And so we got into our wheelie bin, time machine, and we, we pressed the buttons and we went swirling back in time. We were supposed to go back six and a half years to when we first wrote the book, but instead we pressed the wrong buttons and we actually went back 650 million years uh, before life had even begun on Earth. Then we, um, we pressed again and we went back to the age of the dinosaurs when uh, 65 million years ago, dinosaurs ruled the Earth. That's us floating in our bin uh, 65 million years ago. And we saw a particularly bad dinosaur. Does anyone know what dinosaur we, we faced? Yes. Tyrannosaurus rex. Tyrannosaurus rex. Even worse than the Tyrannosaurus rex. Yeah. It was a big nososaurus. That's right. And of course he got so upset and so mad that his nose eventually exploded. Well, Kind of fortunate and unfortunate at the same time. We, we got rid of it, but then we went on to visit many other different time periods. So that's what's going on in the latest book, where we're visiting lots of periods. But I did promise you I would teach you how to um, uh, annoy your parents with a balloon. Um, Okay, so this is the, there's two ways you can do this. You can be annoying with a balloon, but you can also make beautiful music, all right? Now this is the, this is the annoying way. You just grab the balloon, and well, while your parents are trying to cook dinner, or drive the car, or, or your brother and sister watching television, all you have to do is this. <laughs> Yeah. Who wants me to keep going? Yeah. 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 
every night for the whole of my childhood, always in the room where my parents were. I think they enjoyed it. And I learned to play beautiful music. Now, does anyone have a request? Yes, Joseph. Ghostbusters. Ghostbusters. Um, I don't actually know that one so well, but I'll hold that on. Twinkle, twinkle. Twinkle, twinkle, little star. That's a favourite of mine. All right, ready? You can join in once we get going. Twinkle, twinkle, little star, how I want you, what you are. Join in. Up above the world so high, like a diamond in the sky. Hang on. the other 12 doors is your doom. All right? There is a doom that will result in your complete and utter destruction. All right? How many people would take the risk of opening one of the doors to get the packet of chips knowing that there's one chance of getting a bag of chips and 12 chances of, of meeting your doom? That's what I thought. A lot of people. Do you not have chips in America? <laughs> um, all right. What I thought would be fun if uh, if Jeff is up for the challenge is I'm going to let some of you pick a door and see if you can find the chips. And if not, we're going to see what's behind the door thanks to Jeff's incredibly fast and funny. Um, spontaneous drawing skills. Um, my, my computer's about to die, so this is going to get really funny. Um, well, actually, anyone who picks a door is about to die. <laughs> That's kind of funny. Um, I'll get my, I'll get my doors. I know. We do have two. Hang on a minute, Kelsey. I'll just get organised. And I am ready. You're ready? Yes. Uh, to start with, just draw a door. All right. And, and a open or closed? Uh, closed. Closed. All right. Big? Small? Uh, it's just a normal sized door. No. <laughs> All right. How am I doing so far? That's really good. <laughs> you keep up like this, you could get a job drawing for the treehouse. <laughs> Right um, door. That's not a very good feel, I didn't think. That's not very, that's not very professional. 
intentional. <laughs> and now, for America, this is good. <laughs> now, draw, draw one of our audience kind of poised to open it. Maybe, um, uh, uh, like, they're, they're excited, they're, they're expecting a packet of chips, but they're also a little bit scared. And you draw excited and scared in the same... Um, well, that's <laughs> maybe. Okay, let's see. They are. Yeah, how about this? Okay, got it. All right. This is excited and scared, I think. I think I think it should have his tongue out. Yeah. Okay. Uh, to, to indicate the excitement about the. Okay. Right. <laughs> now you've just drawn kind of like an idiotic <laughs> child about to open the door, which I think is actually quite appropriate. Okay, okay. I don't know what's behind it. All right. All right. Um, who would like to open the door first? Um, what's your name, Cody? Okay, yes. Quinch. First, I have a question. Are the chips poisonous? <laughs> Are the chips poisonous? <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> I've never made it to that door, to tell you the truth. Um, Cody, what's your number between 1 and 13? 8. eight door 8. Door 8. Um, sure you don't want to try another door? <laughs> You're happy with door 8? Really? Alright. You open the eighth door and oh that's beautiful. Thank you. Alright, got it. That's Cody. Um, opening the eighth door. Blue handle. Alright. Um you, uh, now can you draw uh, just a blank door? Okay, the old one's gone. The old one's gone. We've we've now opened it. Open. Okay, okay. And you're going to draw what's coming out. You open the eighth door and a big hairy paw reaches out, grabs you, and pulls you in. Uh, so we need a big hand, big scary hand, big scary hand. Grabbing Cody, Cody around the throat. Okay. And pulling him in. Right. Did you say Harry? Uh, yeah. Okay. And this is, I should have saved that copy of the kid. Now I do. Sorry. Yeah. Okay. Let's see. Here we go. Uh, does this look like the guy that we're talking about? Looks like a Sesame Street. <laughs> Uh, 
Ruby is opening door number 13. Okay. And um, let me get a look at Ruby. Where are you, Ruby? Somewhere raise your hand. Okay, gotcha. Okay, we're ready. Are you ready for this? Are you ready? Okay, here we go. You open the 13th door and you see a cute, cuddly koala. It's a koala. What is a koala? Is it sort of like a, an Australian rat? Uh, <laughs> or a, cud a cuddly kind of bear. Uh, okay, this, this could be rough. Hold on. What's huge ears? Actually. Yeah. Cuddly koala, okay, hold on. Uh, female, male, doesn't matter, doesn't matter. You can't tell. Uh, and you pick, and, and Ruby picks it up and cuddles it. Uh, you didn't get treats, but you got a koala. Wait, see. Okay, ready? She's here, okay. And, wait, good, and so far? Ruby, yeah, this is great. Ruby is about to cuddle, uh, cuddle yeah. that cute, cuddly koala's head. It's kind of, what are we doing? It's kind of disembodied head. It's floating there. It's floating there. That's great. Sorry, keep up here. Okay. Yeah, that's good. Yep, yep. Yeah. Oh, it's just riding a Segway. <laughs> <laughs> or has his arms and legs been cut off? <laughs> but, 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 the story's not over yet. I think I'm ready, but I... No, no. Yeah, all right, yes, I'm ready. Don't bother going any further. Ruby's not about to live for much longer. <laughs> Unfortunately, it's a killer koala. I know it! It, it unsheathes... <laughs> it unsheathes its claws and rips your face off. Butterflies, butts. I'm getting there. <laughs> 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 
She's facing away from you. Okay, got it. That's disgusting. Uh, unfortunately, so we've seen the bus. Unfortunately, there are so many, they all tumble out on top of you and you are crushed by butts. And 
um, and then he dies. <laughs> what? What? Okay. That's creepy. <laughs> uh, does, does anyone want to open any more doors? I realize there are no chips now. <laughs> You're just wanting to die. <laughs> Carmella, this, this is a bonus one. Number one. Right. You open the first door and you see your mother. Your Carmela's mother, uh, there's, there's Carmela if you want to make an accurate drawing. <laughs> oh, sorry, Carmela's mother. Yes. That's perfect. Thank you. Well, or is this Carmela? It's just Carmela. Right. Okay, yeah. I'm yeah. very confused. Yeah. And um, Carmela sees her mother. Her mother throws a fridge at her. <laughs> <laughs> I'll have gone through 50 or 60 different ideas and I just pick the 13 most entertaining gadgets. Okay. So I generate many more ideas. And so how do you and Terry work together? Like what, what does that look like? Do you sit in a room? Do you go on a walk? What do you do? Uh, we sit in a room and it looks exactly like what we just modeled there. Yeah, it's me saying, can you draw a butterfly butt? Right. Uh, me, I don't even know what that would look like. Right. But then he draws it and I go, wow, that's <laughs> That's my imagination. I can now see it. Yeah, and I can use that to develop the story. Yeah. yeah. And well, he'll he'll often draw things in the books that I didn't ask for, or he'll draw it wrong, but the wrongness is actually better than what I asked for. <laughs> so I'll change the story to fit the wrongness. And in, there's an example that in Fifty Two Story Treehouse, uh, at the end, Andy and Terry are relaxing in a swimming pool. And when the book was published, I was looking at it and I was going, there's a cow swimming in the swimming pool underneath them with snorkels. And every time they're talking, it's surfacing, like it's spying on them. And I thought, wow. I said, Terry, why did you draw a cow in the swimming pool? And he says, I don't know. And I just 
like drawing cows. <laughs> I said, it looks like it's spying on them. And in the next book, after 65, we're going to have spy cows stealing their ideas. And I said, I want you to hide a cow on every single page of the next book. So, so accidents are actually really useful. Do you have that? Do you have accidents? Not really, actually. Not in that same way. We actually take, I, I take long walks. And as you know, uh, we did run today. Yeah, so uh, so we took like a, a two-hour walk in the rain, and it was, uh, and we walked all the way to Cumberland, Rhode Island, and got totally lost. So that was really cool. Uh, so we're gonna have a minute here where we're going to ask. Uh, actually, before I have one more question for you before we take some questions from the audience, is have you ever written anything that's got you in trouble? Uh, constantly. <laughs> A lot of trouble um, around the time we were doing the bad book, which here is published as Killer Koalas from Outer Space, but we couldn't publish the fringe joke. And there was always this character in the bad book, a little boy, who would ask his mother permission to do something really dangerous. And it was called Bad Mummy, and a busy six-lane highway. And he said, Mummy, can I run across this busy six-lane highway? with my eyes closed. <laughs> and the mother, instead of the bad mother, instead of saying no, she goes, oh, I don't know, that sounds dangerous. And he goes, please, mum, please, please. And she says, all right, but be careful. <laughs> and she says, thanks, mum. And she counts it down, three, two, one. And the boy runs across the road, and there's an enormous explosion as he's hit by a car, and his head flies off, and his arms fly off. And the mother just looks at him and goes, whoops. <laughs> and, walks away. Um, and people said, you're encouraging children to run across the road with their eyes shut. And I said, um, did you actually read it? He gets hit by a car. <laughs> that was a really powerful road safety lesson. Um, I'm actually encouraging parents to say no to their children. Um, so there's a bit of explanation with that one. <laughs> So we know it's a school night, so we're going to take just a few questions from the audience, and then we're going to get to signing your book. All right, so let's get, uh, you've got your turn already, but go ahead. Um, are you going to make another diary of the Are you going to make another diary of the book? I'm really thinking seriously about it. <laughs> yes, I am. I'm working on a 12th book right now. Yes. Okay, so let's try it. We're going to mix it up. Right there, you have a black shirt and maybe glasses. Yes, so shout it out. What happens if you go into the door of that? A little too far. You exit the room from? You go, you go into the door that you enter the room from? Uh, uh, you die. You die. <laughs> <laughs> you be in here. All right, how about you? He has a, a question for you, Andy. Yeah. What was your inspiration? Um, I just always, at school, I loved writing things that made my friends laugh. So when we were supposed to be working, I was down the back drawing cartoons and writing silly things that would make my friends laugh. And I've never grown out of that. Okay, we'll get a question from over here. Yes, you. What inspired me to make Diary of a Wimpy Kid? Same thing. I felt like I was born to be a cartoonist and I got Really lucky that I got my dream. Yes, you. Why is there a fish over there? Why is there a fish over there? It's because there's a refrigerator. Everybody stay away from the kitchen bag. Diary is I know you had a thousand How many pages did you have when you started writing your your first draft of the thirteenth story treehouse? One. I had one page, and there was nothing on it. Um, uh, so, in fact, that was true. I said to Terry, can you draw that tree house? And I was looking at pictures of trees, and when I saw his picture, then I started writing. So. But we do, I, I worked on the books with Jill, my wife, who was a character in this thing, and we rewrite them uh, for a whole year. So we're, we're working over and over again. So, a lot of pages and a lot of ideas. For him? 
Is there ever going to be 130 stories in the trest? No, because there are no numbers over 100. <laughs> if you've read the books, you know I can't count <laughs> very well. And I believe there are no such numbers over 100. But unless there are, and maybe. What's that? Does Mr. Andy realize that he's sit sitting right under a refrigerator? No. I'm going to take a picture of us. <laughs> So thank you everyone who's come out to talk today. Thank you. And what we're going to do now is that Kim Havens is going to tell us all how this is going to go. I will say we'll sign uh, sign all your books. If you haven't had a chance to buy any of Andy's books, uh, definitely go downstairs, come back up, you won't lose your place in line. And uh, we're going to get, get to signing and taking pictures. Thanks, Kim. Thank you. Thank you. Okay.